You know, one of the biggest questions that you and I need to answer, perhaps even on a daily basis, is, is God trustworthy? Can what I read in the scripture, can I take as the truth? Um, can I organize my life around the truth that I find in God's word? You know, in the first six chapters of Daniel, we watched Daniel uh, and his three friends put that into practice. They, their situations were quite a bit different than ours culturally, that's for sure, but each, each one of them faced the kinds of the, the categories of situations that you and I fe face in many ways. You know, they, they had an environment that was hostile to belief in the living God, that he was living and active uh, and working in people's lives. Uh, they had enemies that tried to do us in. Many times we have people who are really trying to get be one up on us with regard to that. And in their situation, they had very much difficulty uh, and yet stood for the truth. And you and I also have opportunities to stand for the truth, even when it seems the truth uh, is not the, the thing that, that is the conventional wisdom. So we've seen them in an actual practice. And then, of course, last week we began uh, with the second part of, of the book, which deals with these visions and dreams that Daniel had, which re reveal things that were future to him and many things that were even future to us. But I imagine you ask yourself as you were threading through uh, this text, you know, what do I need to know about rams and goats and uh, horns and all that kind of stuff? Um, you may, you're probably not an ancient Near Eastern scholar, neither am I. <laughs> I can read some books about it, but uh, you know, this is not our comfortable place, is it? Uh, and yet, uh, this is important for us to understand what God is doing as he's giving Daniel these, uh, these visions. Um, it, in our day, you just watch television and, and, or get the news any way you get it. And I don't know, I get such an overcoming sense that evil is just raising its head. I was thinking some of us remember way back, I was very young, but remember back to the days of World War II, and I thought about how terrible things were at that point. Uh, there was, it was, the world was just coming apart with regard to that. And I think we're, there's something similar uh, that is happening today. Um, evil, uh, how does that relate to what Daniel is given as far as information? Well, underlying this too, what does Daniel tell us about believing the Bible uh, and how God gives us a basis for actually trusting what him and what he says? Uh, you know, Daniel, in as well as this chapter, as well as previous ones, confirms two things. One, the God of the Bible is the true God. Uh, that we saw all the way through. Nebuchadnezzar um, uh, had it confessed that uh, with regard to uh, Daniel's interpretation of his dream of the image. Uh, he confessed that with regard to uh, the th three friends that were delivered from the uh, fiery furnace. Uh, after he emerged from his insanity, he also had to confess that, that God is the real God. Uh, and the other thing that we know uh, from what Daniel has, and this chapter is one of the particularly helpful things here, is that the Bible is the trustworthy and true revelation that God has for us. It's trustworthy and it's true. Uh, we'll see that as, as we go through. Uh, I, I was very much taken, uh, and I don't know if you had time as you did your lesson this week on page 86, don't look for it, uh, but there was further study and they gave us some rev um, passages, text from Isaiah. Isaiah now was uh, prophesying uh, 200 years or so before Daniel's life, and of course uh, centuries before, uh, before we uh, are looking at it. But in Daniel, a number of places in our book gives us these uh, references where God claims to be the one who knows the future. He claims to be the one who is organizing it. He claims to be the one who is sovereign over it. It is marvelous to see how now Daniel is, who knew Isaiah, uh, not personally, but he knew the book of Isaiah. Uh, he knew Jeremiah, we'll, we'll find that out a little bit later. So he must have known uh, Isaiah as well. And Daniel now sees confirmed in the visions that he's given, the things that God said about himself in Isaiah, 
And now we in the 21st century have even more evidence to go on that God does know the future. He's the one who organizes it. He's the one who is in control of it. And so we're a part of a long line of people who, as they understand that this is the word of God, that it is true revelation, uh, that we, we can know that what God is doing, uh, we may not like it, but we, we can know that God hasn't taken his hand off the steering wheel, uh, that indeed things are going in accordance with exactly how he has it planned. Uh, our chapters two through seven uh, really gave us a picture with a viewpoint of looking at it from the Gentile powers, Babylon and then uh, even chapter seven, uh, where we had those beasts that came, uh, came out of the sea and all of that. And the Jewish nation really did not factor in to what was being revealed in chapters 2 through 7. And it's very interesting. You noted in, in your book that chapter 2, verse 4, from that point through the end of chapter 7 is written not in the Hebrew, which the rest of the Old Testament is written in, but in the Aramaic language, which was the, the, uh, the commercial language, the, the language of the people. Uh, in that day. And so it appears that as God is revealing in the book of Daniel what's happening with regard to the Gentile powers, he's using a language uh, that can be understood and w is, could be expected to be understood with regard to that. Uh, Jesus in Luke 21, when he's talking about uh, the end times, the, the disciples ask him what's going to happen to the temple and all of that. He speaks in Luke 21, 24 about the term, the times of the Gentiles. And it appears that what Jesus was referring to is that there was a period of time from when, when Daniel was taken captive, when Jerusalem was uh, no longer uh, functioning as the place where God had his name. Uh, so back then in, in 586 BC when Jerusalem was, was uh, demolished, uh, from that point even through our day and into the time that we will see even future uh, to the predictions that we have here, that seems to be what, what Jesus is referring to as the times of the Gentiles. Uh, the Jews are not playing a major part in history. Uh, Jesus, uh, God is not dealing particularly with the Jewish nation. Uh, but there comes a time, Romans tells us, we have a number of other points as well as in the book of Revelation, we see that there will be a time when the times of the Gentiles are ended and where now God begins to deal again with the Jewish nation. So chapters two through seven really give us the, the big picture from the Gentile viewpoint, not that, that they're doing it, but it, we see it through their eyes. But in verse one of chapter eight, then he reverts to Hebrew and he goes all the way through, Daniel does into, through chapter 12 in the Hebrew language. And you will see little, little pinpoints of the fact that this is now talking about the Jews. Uh, these things that are happening, are, God is, is zeroing in on the things with regard to how that has importance uh, for the Jewish nation. Um, we're going to take one bite at a time, uh, and we're, we're going to just see what we can, we can do with this with regard to that. Uh, our, changing the metaphor now, our, our camera that really had the wide angle in ch chapter 7, these four major empires that we identified as Babylon and uh, Medo-Persia and then Greece and then Rome, those four that corresponded, those beasts that corresponded to what, what Nebuchadnezzar saw in the statue in chapter uh, 2, those four. Now, we're going we're gonna to forget the two outside ones. We're going to forget the Babylon and we're going to forget the Rome one for, for now and instead zero in on the two nations that are kind of in the middle, the ones who uh, in, the, uh, in the statue were uh, the chest and the arms of silver, that, that's the medieval Persian, and then the uh, bronze belly and thighs, or as we saw, the bear and the leopard in, in chapter 7. Are you with me? You, I, I want us just to be able to see that this is not just coming from the sky blue. Uh, there is purpose in how God is now zeroing in and helping Daniel, first of all, and then us to at least have a, a bit of an understanding of what's happening. So 
long introduction, but here we go with, uh, with verse 1 of, of Daniel chapter 8. Uh, in the third year of uh, Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. Two years before, in the first year, was when he saw chapter 7. Uh, in my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Um, this is interesting because at, in, when Daniel was living, uh, Susa was just kind of a country bumpkin town. I showed you on the map that, that we had in the opening time where it is, about 200 miles east of Babylon. Uh, but in the Persian kingdom, it became one of the areas where the Persian kings had their palaces. And if you did De Esther with us, you'll remember that that's the, the location that the book of Esther takes place in, 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 in Shushan or Susa, the palace. Nehemiah serves the, the Persian king uh, in that city as well. But so God, in this vision, moves Daniel into this particular place. He's able to locate it with regard to that. And then what does he see? Well, he begins... Um, and I think as you have read this, I'm not going to read the entire scripture because I want to save time for some other things. But he sees this ram that has two horns, one's longer than the other and grows up later. And from what we know about the bear on its side last week, last uh, week we understand that the, the coalition of the Medes and the Persians uh, began fairly equally, but, even, but soon the Persians took over, uh, and the Medes were, were just uh, not in, in the actual leadership of it. One longer and grew up later, and then this ram is seen as just unhindered, going from the west uh, to, to the north and the south. Uh, it, it's uh, to the west, I'm sorry, in the north and the south. Uh, it, it's going, in, and it is uh, attacking all and, and conquering all of that. And then suddenly, as we see in um, verse um, 7, we see this goat that comes, comes forth with regard to that. And this goat comes suddenly. Uh, it has one prominent horn, and it comes from the west uh, toward the east. It attacks the ram. It breaks its horns, and it conquers. It's very vicious. We can see that. Uh, but then at the height of its power, then this horn is broken and four horns rise up to take its place. Uh, verses 9 to 12 then are the ones that really cause us a lot of puzzlement with regard to that. So let me read verses 9 to 12. Out of one of them, out of one of the four horns, came another horn which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. Don't you love you can almost hear Daniel longing to be back there as he, t he speaks about where he came from as the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of heavens and it threw some of the starry hosts down to earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and isn't this a terrible phrase, and truth was thrown to the ground. So this is now the vision uh, that Daniel has. And then he sees in verse 31, actually he hears a holy one speaking and another holy one saying to him, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot. Uh, there are angelic beings that are witnessing this evidently. And so one says to the other, uh, how long will this be? And so the answering angelic being says, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be re-consecrated. So that's now the vision. Now we want to know what it's about. And isn't it interesting that really, God names names here, doesn't he? He names the two names of these empires. That hasn't happened in any of the other revelations of these empires until we have, as I've explained things about chapter 2 and as I explained things about chapter 7, I can say that historically speaking we can look and see these empires. But now God is giving the, the answer to who are these empires uh, in, in this particular one. So verse 15, while I, Daniel, was, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, 
there stood before me one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. As I came near the place where I was, as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and felt prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. So here now is one of the two angels that is mentioned, their names are mentioned in scripture, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, you know, has a major part in the drama of the birth of Christ. He is the one who appears to uh, Zacharias to announce John the Baptist's birth uh, and also uh, to Mary. And uh, he, so he is, he is mentioned with regard to that. Michael is the other one who's named, and we will see him in our, several of our chapters in Daniel as we're working through this. But this now is, is, is a named angel. It's Gabriel. Um, and uh, so this now, as he, as Daniel, is really terrified by the glory of this angel. And it, it's very interesting that in the New Testament, when angels appear to Mary or to Joseph the fir and to Zacharias, the first words out of their mouth is, don't be afraid. <laughs> and um, so here, son of man, he, he doesn't say don't be afraid, but he says, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Uh, when we in the 21st century read the Bible and have the New Testament, uh, when we read about the time of the end, we kind of automatically flip into, oh, that means the end times, that means revelation. Uh, however, scripture can use the time of the end as, as pertaining to epochs, as is to historical uh, way, ways that things will be happening. And so it appears that this vision does not give the time that we would consider time of the end, revelation type stuff. But indeed, the time of the end that is, that is really far down the way from where Daniel is. Uh, it, it'll be centuries before uh, all of this takes place. Uh, and in fact, uh, in verse 26, uh, he, the, he's told that this seals up, seal up the vision because it concerns the distant future. Uh, so let's not get hung up about how does this then impact what we read in the New Testament about Revelation. Uh, instead, we, we can see that, that um, the angel, Gabriel, is uh, encountering Daniel, and he's going to help him, but verse 18, while he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. He touched me and raised me to my feet. This was a life-impacting confrontation, is it not? So then he tells you, he says, verse 19, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. Here's another w phrase uh, that is, is giving uh, to Daniel an understanding of a distant time from him. Uh, two horned ram, verse, two, v verse 20, that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Now this is still before the handwriting on the wall. This is still while Belshazzar is king. Probably at several years before Medes and the Persians conquer Babylon, but it's identified as the Medes and Persians. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from this, his nation, but not have the same power. Let's stop there, and we can see what we can understand with regard to that. We know that Media, Media Persia becomes the Persian Empire, and the Persian Empire, we will see, uh, and, and we know from other scripture as well, is, is what allowed some of the Jews to go back to their land. Ne Nehemiah uh, wa was able to go back, and uh, King Cyrus, the king of Persia, was, was regarding that. But there doesn't seem to be the focus on that kingdom now, uh, except as how it is then leading to the next kingdom, which is Greece. Now, Greece, in Daniel's time, was the end of the earth. There was, there was no, you know, no civilization that they knew of uh, that happened with regard to Greece. So think, now we think, oh yeah, we know where Greece is. And we, you know, looking at the map, it's the closest uh, area of, of the biblical lands to us. 
But this would have been way, way, way out of, out of the way with, for regard, regarding Daniel. Uh, the, the shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. Uh, now, history tells us that uh, Philip of Macedon was actually the one who gathered together the tribes that made up then the Greek uh, nation. He's the one who kind of pulled them together. But it was his son, Alexander, that actually was the first king and is understood as the first ruler of the Greek kingdom. And so this, um, this large horn between the eyes of the goat is understood as being Alexander the Great. Uh, and, and remember, that's the one then who, who, who uh, so quickly conquered the world. Um, in, in three years, Alex, history, history tells us that Alexander moved from Greece all the way over to India, uh, conquering all as he went. And in fact, he died in Babylon at the age of 32, um, no, moaning that he had no more worlds to conquer because he, had, he has done them all by the age actually of 29. Uh, so we can identify this large horn in the Greek empire as Alexander the Great. Alexander, being a young man, uh, had no heirs. And so when Alexander died, his, all of this empire was divided up geographically into four pieces that were, were then ruled by one, each one, one of his generals. Um, you don't need to know the names, but I looked them up, so I'll tell you. Cassander uh, got Macedonia and Greece. Lys Lysimachus uh, got the area that's the, like Turkey today. Uh, Seleucius got Syria and the lands to the east toward Babylon. And Ptolemy got Egypt and possibly Palestine and the east of the Jordan. This, those last two, Seleucius and Ptolemy, will make an appearance in chapter 10. So just kind of hold that thought with regard to that. Uh, but these were the, f history tells us that uh, these four generals then fit the, the uh, prophecy about the fact that these four kingdoms will, re will emerge from the one kingdom that Alexander the Great had. So, so far so good, we're good at that. But now we have to deal with what is this little horn. First of all, I need to tell you that in chapter seven, there was also a little horn. Uh, but that little horn came from the fourth kingdom. And so we're not considering that horn being the same as this one, because this one is coming out of the third kingdom, which has been identified as Greece. Okay, are you, are you with me on that? Let's just, so we don't get really confused. Verse 9 about this little horn tells us that um, this horn started small, but grew in power to the east, to the south and to the east toward the beautiful land. And then it, it grows and grows and grows. Um, moving forward then into verse 23, where we find out more about this little horn, uh, we find out that in the latter part of these four kings reign now, uh, when the rebels have become completely wicked, notice there's, there's a lawlessness that's, that comes in with regard to that, uh, a wicked, no, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not on his own power. Uh, he will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. Notice the the holy people, the nation of Israel, is coming into play here. Uh, he will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince, capital P, of princes. Yet he will, will be destroyed, but not by human power. So we have a very threatening uh, description of this little horn that now becomes a big horn, uh, who wrecks havoc, really, uh, on the Jewish people, but eventually he is destroyed. But he's just destroyed not by human power. Identification of this king is also very, very secure in that in the Greek kingdom, out of the, the kingdom of Seleucus, the one who had Damascus, uh, out of that kingdom there, there was a dynasty that was called Antiochus. Uh, Antiochus III had a son 
called Antiochus IV. Uh, he gave himself also the name Antiochus IV Epiphanes because he called himself God made manifest. I'm God in the flesh. Uh, the Jews called him uh, Antiochus, Antiochus Epimenes, which means the madman, but they did so behind his back uh, because he, of course, did not want to do that. Uh, history tells us that he ruled from 175 to 164 B.C. and that he died in 163 B.C. I think, uh, where did I have that? He died in Persia, uh, a, a very gruesome death, we understand. He attempted to just obliterate the Jewish faith completely and substitute Greek customs and the Greek religion for uh, the, the religion of Jehovah. Uh, the story of his reign and how God enabled the Jewish people to overcome him is told in the books that the Protestant Bible does not include, but the Catholic Bible has a section between Malachi and Matthew that's called the Apocrypha, and it's the, the name of the books is First and Second Maccabees. And although those, those we, under, we, don't, we don't consider that those two books are inspired in the same way that our 66 books are, yet they can be valuable in telling us what went on and how God really in, acted on behalf of his people. Uh, and it's, it's told in these two books, first and second, Maccabees. Uh, one of the priests, uh, had four sons, and they decided they were going to uh, they were going to rise up against this ruler, and against all odds, uh, the, these insurrectionists, led by one of the sons called Judas Maccabeus, uh, took over and were able to uh, to overcome all of these things that Antiochus Epiphanes uh, was trying to do. He deliberately. Sac Antiochus Epiphanes deliberately desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. The worst thing that happened was he sacrificed a sow, a pig, on the, tem on the altar in the temple, which would have been the worst thing that could happen for the Jewish people uh, because, of course, pigs were unclean and, and lambs were the ones that were to be, uh, be sacrificed. Uh, in Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking, of, answering the questions of the disciples about what's going to happen, um, in Matthew 24, uh, as Jesus is talking about what's going to be happening, uh, if you'd like to turn to it, you might, if it's convenient for you, because it, it's really helpful, I think, for us to see. I don't want to take too much time, but uh, I think it's helpful for us to see. Think now. And that Antiochus Epiphanes is this wicked ruler who's tried to, to wipe out the Jewish religion. Um, Jesus now is in centuries after that, uh, but he's going to talk about what's going to happen in a time future to him, uh, his time on earth, and also future we know now to us. But uh, in Matthew 24, uh, verse uh, 15, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, this is um, another term for what Antiochus did, uh, spoken up through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand that those who are, who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The reason I'm showing you this is because Antiochus and all the terrible things that he did seems to prefigure another character that is going to rise in times that are end times to us, who is called Antichrist, who evidently will be doing the same kind of thing in, in desecrating holy things as Antiochus did. And so Jesus said, you'll be able to link your understanding of, of what's happening when you see this happen, because this is the same thing that, I, that Daniel told about with regard to the first bad guy, to the first, to the first Antiochus. Uh, Jesus uses this term then to refer to a person that we consider to be called the Antichrist, capital A, anti, 
Christ. And just today I was reading uh, in my regular Bible reading in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, and it talks about this man of lawlessness that, that is to come forth. Here again is a thread that's going to be coming through with regard to that. Daniel doesn't give information about the Antichrist. But Jesus linking this vision of this terrible ruler who desecrates the temple with what's going to happen under a t another terribly wicked ruler at the end times uh, is kind of the link that helps us understand what Jesus meant with regard to spoken of by the prophet Daniel there in verse, 20, verse 15 of chapter 25. You with me? Okay. I hope so. I hope so. Um, and what, one of the things about Old Testament prophecy is, the, and New Testament prophecy too, is often in prophecy there is a, a, an immediate uh, under, uh, taking place of what is prophesied. But often there's also a distant one that is very similar and that the original prophecy includes the, the near fulfillment as well as the far fulfillment. And this is what we see in Daniel chapter 8 as this wicked little horn that's going to now try to obliterate the Jewish people uh, and desecrate all of the holy things. How that then, uh, he, he will be uh, in, uh, in, in the near future, near to, to we've seen it happen. Uh, but also in the far distant future, even to that which is us. The Jews revolted. I, I need to tell you the end of the story. The Jews, Jews revolted against uh, Antiochus. Uh, and uh, in, on December 14th, 164 BC, the temple was reconsecrated. We see uh, that that is going to um, happen uh, under the Maccabeans. And that is what the Jews celebrate as Hanukkah the festival of lights, when the lights were turned on again in the temple and was cleansed and they were able to offer sacrifices. So you see how so much of this has, has interesting stuff, even though it's really hard to understand. Um, not clear what the 2,300 evenings and mornings are. Uh, there are several uh, kind of complicated explanations and I didn't want to deal with them, but they all appear to be having to do with the fact that this wicked ruler uh, has, has, has forbidden the sacrifices, the regular Jewish sacrifices that would be happening both in the evening and in the morning. Uh, we can't pin down the exact number of days, uh, but scripture isn't always exactly to the point, of, you know, the decimal point that we have with regard to that. So I think that what, what we're being told here is that, uh, that this will happen uh, 2,300 days and then verse 14, the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. We see that, the 164 uh, BC with regard to um, the Maccabees reconstituting the temple. So what is, what is Daniel told then? Well, he's told the, um, uh, in verse 26, he said, the vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been given to you is true but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. Uh, this again was something we, we're going to see in the next verse. Daniel was still very, very, very <coughs> perplexed. He, did, he didn't know what I'm telling you about Antiochus and all of that stuff. And so even though he had an a angelic um, interpretation, he didn't understand all of that and how that could actually happen. But he, he is told to seal up the vision, uh, which means not that, that, um, that it's not going to happen, but that it is going to happen. It's not going to get changed. Uh, I, God has decreed that this is going to happen. Uh, not, it's not necessarily a secret, uh, but, and Daniel, you can be sure that, that it will happen. But it concerns, as the angel sell, tells him, the far distant future. So what is Daniel's response? Uh, well, he's exhausted, he's ill, he does go back to work, uh, but this has really shaken him. Uh, he says he's appalled beyond, this was beyond understanding. Uh, 
a scary thing, of course. Those, those beasts in chapter 7 were scary enough. But now he is seeing empires that are kind of passing right in front of his eyes. Uh, and it's so much more than he can ever even grasp. But I think the thing that is so um, riveting for him is, this is going to happen to my people. My, when we see in chapter 9, uh, when we see him praying that God would give the people the opportunity to go back after the 70 years is finished, uh, Daniel would be hoping that everything would go back to normal. And yet this is saying, no, God's plans for these world empires and their interaction with the Jewish people uh, d does not bode easily for the Jewish people. And so he is uh, here, as well as we, uh, we, we're going to see in chapter 9, he is terrified and he is grieving over what the true God is saying about what is going to happen. It's a grim future for the Jewish people. We've seen that in history, haven't we? And, and, and this Bible doesn't even, well, Daniel didn't even know uh, um, about Haman. And Daniel didn't even know about Hitler uh, and the many, many people throughout the centuries that have tried to obliterate the Jewish people. Uh, but God knew about it. And God knew. One of the things that's important to know is that God knows not only how it's going to begin, but that it will end. 2300 evenings and mornings indicates there's going to be a starting point and a stopping point. God has this under control. Uh, God gives Daniel names, places, things that we can confirm in secular history. Um, is Daniel's God the ruler of the universe? Does he, is he in control? Um, are there situations today that are similar? Many of them. I just read yesterday on the internet about some of the um, Boko Haram in, in Nigeria and how a pastor on a bus uh, was confronted by a guy with a, a pistol and um, said, will you recant and, uh, and not, believe, not believe in Christianity? And the pastor said, no, uh, I stand for Christ. And, and he was just shot right there on the bus. In, in the, I mean, it's happening today. Think of the Christians in, in Iraq uh, that are being slaughtered because they are Christians. Uh, this is now happening not just to the Jewish people, but it is also happening today. But is God in control? Yes. We don't know. He's God and we are not. So we don't know how he, why he allows it. Evil will prosper in the earth. But God knows the end from the beginning. And so as we, as we leave chapter 8 and go into chapter 9, we can say that his word is trustworthy, that what he reveals gives us total confidence in what he says. And you can take it to the bank. Heavenly Father, thank you that your word is true. Uh, from the very smallest child to those of us who are quite old, we can understand that what you say in your book with words are true. And I thank you for that. I thank you we can teach that to our children. But we can also live them, that out in our day. Uh, thank you for Daniel and for the revelation that you gave him. I pray that you will give us the kind of faithfulness to, that Daniel had and also the, the um, insight into human tragedy as well as your plan that we get from this passage of scripture. I pray that you will give us uh, perseverance as we look at chapter 9 and that as we come together we will be able to uh, understand just a little bit more about what you have to say to us through your word. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.